Hello and welcome to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. I'm your host, Ian Hart. It's solo edition on this fine Tuesday. Got some friends and co-workers on vacation, but I got the top 400 dynasty ranks out. I want to bark about some football. So thank you, as always, for tuning in. And yeah, today's episode, I just want to go through QB, running back, wide receiver, tight end, top 12, and then just some of the, you know, kind of more interesting slash important slash maybe even controversial, you know, 1v1 takeaways I had as I was kind of putting these together over the past few weeks. Fear not, I'm going to be going much more in depth on all these positions through, uh, throughout the course over the next few weeks. I've already been able to lock down the late round quarterback whisperer himself, in addition to Mike Clay as some guests to come on and talk about him too, people. That's always my goal here. Like I would like for myself to be as accurate as possible with all this stuff, but God forbid I do screw up here or there. Want to bring on enough sharp minds to tell me I'm wrong so you all can get what really matters, which is the most accurate and actionable information that we can offer. So without further ado, everyone, let's get after it. Starting off with quarterbacks. Now, I guess first things first, as I'm just completely contradict where I was going there. Let's first look at just a few things that we've already seen before on this podcast in terms of dynasty, but the importance of age and years of experience and kind of what they can have by position because it does change a lot. And, you know, shout out to my YouTube fan out there, uh, YouTube fam out there. If you want to check it out, check out the podcast on YouTube. You can kind of follow along and see exactly the numbers I'm looking at. But basically, in terms of age and fantasy football, quarterback and tight end are other positions where it matters the absolute least. And yes, you know, your Tom Brady's and Rob Gronk, not even your Gronk's, your Tony Gonzalez is more so of the world, do skew these numbers to, to an extent. With that said, guys like Aaron Rodgers, um, you know, even like guys like Ryan Tannehill and Kirk Cousins are starting to get up there. So even when we do see quarterbacks play for 10 plus years, start to get into their mid 30s, you know, your Drew Brees of the world, if you will, these guys can still put up big time numbers, far more so than the running backs and wide receivers. Running backs, we see them take a pretty big step backwards after the age of 26, huge one backwards after the age of 28. Wide receivers do last a little bit longer, but by the time, you know, 30, 31 comes around, that's when we're starting to see guys really start to fall off a cliff. There will always be exceptions. There will always be outliers, but it's hard to guess those. They're called exceptions and they're called outliers for a reason. That's why we don't want to hang our hat on trying to predict them year in and year out. So, you know, it's just a similar, just a similar thing to, you know, think about when you're gambling, uh, all right, and you just bet straight up on a game, minus 115 on both sides. You know, you don't exactly have a 50-50 chance of getting it right, but you kind of know what's going on one side versus the other. Now, if you have a parlay where it's plus 1,000, yeah, the outcome looks fantastic. You can win, you can 10 times your money that you're putting in, but let's face it, a little bit harder to know what's going to happen with the outlier parlay compared to the 1v1 situation. So not sure that was the best example in the world. You guys get what I'm trying to say though, just in terms of, you know, trying to use this data as the guide. And I don't want to make too big of a habit of expecting guys to beat 10 plus years worth of data. So again, we want to really lean to the youthful side of things in dynasty land far more so uh, than in redraft. And again, those rough age cutoffs we're looking at for running backs and wide running backs. We're looking at, you know, 26 to 28 is about the time we want to get off wide receivers, you know, 30, to 31 when things are probably not going to get better they can still be productive again these charts i'm only showing the top 12 fantasy producers obviously if someone finishes as the wide receiver 15 16 24 you're still happy with that production it's just in terms of you know what our expectations should be for these guys moving forward and it's particularly important to remember that in dynasty land so with all that said now let's kick things off with a look at the quarterback position my top 12 dynasty quarterbacks number one Patrick Mahomes, followed by Josh Allen, Justin Herbert, Joe Burrow, Lamar Jackson, Kyler Murray, Dak Prescott, Russell Wilson, Justin Fields, Trey Lance, Deshaun Watson, and Matthew Stafford. Now, a few things about this top 12. I think Mahomes, you can see him consensus number one across the entire industry. And after that, it's also pretty tough to get away from Josh Allen and Justin Herbert. Both have multiple years of high-end fantasy goodness. It's easy to look back at Josh Allen, what he did in the playoffs, and just be like, yeah, number two, if not number one best quarterback in the freaking game at this point just realized though it was much more of a roller coaster regular season for him in terms of being a real life passer look at pff grade quarterback rating qbr yards per attempt whatever you want you know the graphs are going up and down all year long for uh josh allen it didn't matter in fantasy though because things like rushing yards and particularly for josh rushing touchdowns are just such a cheat code 
that we could deal with the real life lows because of how high how high he remains as a fancy signal caller. And similar story, Justin Herbert. Maybe he didn't have such a volatile year as Josh Allen, but whether or not you want to crown him as a real life quarterback yet, we now have back to back years of Herbert absolutely balling out as a top 10 fancy QB. I think that big three is pretty clear. This is where it gets tough. Burrow versus Lamar Jackson versus Kyler. You know, the guys are separated by less than a year of age all the way around. Burrow and Jackson, just 25 years old. Kyler Murray halfway uh, through his age 24 year. If you wanted to flip these guys and like, look, I'm going to have a quarterback tears uh, call them out um, next week. And I'm going to be talking about um, all these with, uh, you know, with, with Mike Clay. So we'll have much more in-depth discussion kind of on these guys. But, you know, Burrow, Jackson, Kyler, again, if you wanted to reverse that, I wouldn't call you an idiot by any stretch of the imagination. I understand the upside and the allure of rushing quarterbacks. But I just think when you look at these guys, you know, for the next five plus years, who are we the most confident and consistently supplying some QB1 goodness? I got to give the edge to Joe Burrow there. I mean, we saw him really be a borderline QB one as a rookie when he had the sort of volume we were hoping for. Then in 2021, he didn't get the volume, but we saw the efficiency go up to the top of the league. Ultimately, it's just enough for me to crown him. I would say the stable QB metrics are the big takeaway for Burrow. I think he's going to be a top four to five passing quarterback in the league for the next decade because some of the metrics that we look at and rely on most that we just see, you know, time and time again, year to year, less volatile than others. Like things like pressure and deep ball. It's just things that we see come down over time because it's tough to be that good again and again and again. But Joe Burrow, everyone, passing grade from a clean pocket last year. First, standard dropbacks, you know, just straight back in the pocket. First, first and second down. First, no play action. First, pass the stone out or behind the sticks. Second. So I just think Burrow is such an anomaly in, I'm not, Compare, I'm not comparing him to the career of Tom Brady or anything like that. I just mean as a fantasy drop back pocket passer, I think Burrow is a quote unquote elite enough to still get the bump ahead of, you know, your more fantasy friendly dual threat quarterbacks. Not to say I'm out on Lamar and Kyler. They are my QB five and QB six. Uh, again, it's just a really tough call between Burrow and those two guys. Back half of the QB1 rankings, Dak, Russ, getting up there a little bit in age. But again, you know, Russ sitting there at 33, Dak's going to be 29 by week one of next season. We've just continued to see quarterbacks, particularly some like Russ and Dak, who, yes, they're mobile, but we've seen more than enough examples of them winning as a pure passer that I just think, you know, still being able to rely on these guys for five years uh, is makes some sense. After that, Justin Fields, Trey Lance, saw everything we needed to see from them as rookies in terms of having that dual threat upside, getting those rush attempts. Now, Fields, to me, is ahead of Lance because he showed us just a little bit more as a pure passer. Uh, if you do check out my article, I just got some funky, funky highlights. Oh, there we go. Always got to put my primetime music in the background of these things. But, man, Fields last year wasn't all great. We had a lot of turnover-worthy plays, took a lot of sacks, held on to the ball too long. But some of the passing highlights that he put on tape, truly borderline erotic people. I'm not saying Lance can't get there. I saw the, you know, back shoulder curl he had to Brandon Ayuk in, in his start. Like he he had the Kittle throw down the seam that Kittle snagged one-handed. Like Lance has some good tape too, but I just think Fields, as someone who's not exactly a quarterback whisperer though, but I think if you all watch Fields versus Lance as well, you can tell which one, you know, has a little bit better grasp on touch and reading defenses at this point. Either way though, once again, we're talking about two top 10 dynasty quarterbacks rounding out the group the sean watson qb 11 there were no legal problems watson would be my qb4 only behind mahomes allen and herbert after him matthew stafford just one spot ahead of aaron Rodgers. so stafford 34 years old rogers is 38 like okay redraft everyone's going to rank rogers over stafford as you should the question is how much longer is he going to play i really think in you can hear A.J. Hawk uh, talk about this on Pat McAfee's show. A.J. Hawk, very good friend of Aaron Rodgers. And throughout last year, this year, he said the same thing, that he thinks it's going to be really tough for Rodgers to hang up the cleats when he's continuing to play at this high of a level. Don't have any immediate reasons to believe that level of play is going to be dropping off. Again, based on what we've seen from these you know, more elderly quarterbacks in recent years, Rodgers could still have three good ones left. But there is enough concern here for me to drop him, you know, outside of kind of the Dak Russ uh Watson group where uh, you know he's probably spent more time than not over the past five years 
after Rodgers, a couple of just, I'm not going to go through the entire uh, 40, 50 QBs I rank, but a couple of things that are interesting to me. Trevor Lawrence versus Jalen Hurts. So looking around the industry, it was pretty unanimous that Jalen Hurts was ranked higher than Trevor Lawrence. I disagree, people. I have Lawrence QB 14, Jalen Hurts QB 16. I see Hurts across the industry usually as a top 10 guy. Ask my lovely Twitter followers what you guys thought in terms of Hurts versus Lawrence straight up in Dynasty. Got 4,000 votes. 65% said Trevor Lawrence. 34% uh, said Jalen Hurts. So, hey, you know, I see the allure for Hurts. Straight up, if both guys are starting for the next 10 years, give me Hurts. But what did we see with Hurts last year? They started off the year, they were throwing the ball around. He was still putting up some decent passing numbers, always putting up great fantasy numbers. But remember, you know, the comps between him and DeAndre Swift and how much of that was coming in the fourth quarter. Like he overcame a lot of that. But th to do that, they had to switch to the most run heavy offense in the entire league. And we just didn't really see Hurts, in my opinion, went over and just win outright as a passer efficiency wise. Now, the reason why we were on him going to last year was because we don't care about style points in fantasy. He had thrown for over 300 yards in two of his first career, two of his first four career starts back in 2020. My question is, you know, with Nick Sirianni there, I think he likes Hurts, but he's also not exactly the guy that brought him into the picture in the first place. And like, are we really convinced that Hurts, who is not on the five-year first-round contract, are we really convinced he's going to get re-upped by Philly? I'm not. So, you know, Lawrence, I do think we have four, we have four more years with Trevor Lawrence in Jacksonville. I would be, I know he was bad last year, but couldn't name, you know, a worse set of circumstances. I'm going to give Lawrence a nod because I think at worst, we have a couple more years where he is going to be, you know, a starter. And again, best guesses here, people. But with Hurts, man, I just think there's too low of a floor. When he's out there, it's fantastic. I'm not convinced he's going to be out there for much longer. And this is not my personal feelings on if Hurts can do it or not. It's my feelings on if the Eagles or another team will be willing to give him that opportunity. Another one that I at least, you know, thought was pretty close was Tua versus Baker Mayfield. Now, I told you guys the Lawrence and Hurts one kind of went in my direction uh, and what I was thinking. Uh, contrary to po uh, popular and consensus opinion, this one, not so much. I was kind of leaning towards Baker. 88% of my lovely Twitter followers and out of 4,000 votes went with Tua, just 12% with Baker. And I do, after I thought about it more, I am siding with Tua just by a hair. It's close though, people. I really think Baker, if you're doing, and you guys know me, I talk all types of shit about Baker because I'm an OBJ stan and I hated that narrative that OBJ was the problem. But all that nonsense aside, the thing with Baker I mean, he's shown the ability to be a high-end quarterback twice, in the back half of 2018 as a rookie and the back half of 2020. Now, we were hoping that the back half of 2020 was going to lead to even greater things in 2021, but what happened? The dude tore his freaking labrum in week two against the Texans clearly wasn't the same. Now, how much did that injury and the other injuries he had to deal with you know, play into his ability? That's a good question, but the fact that we can now get Baker as you know, not even really like a QB2, we can offer honestly draft him as like a QB three to fill out your roster and dynasty. And we still have a former number one overall pick who has proved on two separate occasions to be a higher end quarterback than Tua has ever have. To be fair, uh, I do think Baker is, you know, a really prime buy low candidate because you don't need to spend much to get the guy. So if he does continue to suck, you're not going to lose much because he didn't cost much in the first place. But like I said, Tua does deserve to be ahead of him because Tua by by week one next year, Tua will only be 24. Baker will be 27. Tua, you know, worst offensive line in the league. Maybe the Panthers were a little bit worse. Also didn't have Will Fuller for all but one game. Devontae Parker was banged up. That RPO offense, like the question is, was that offense – the ceiling of what the Dolphins could do based on their resources, or was that the offense based on what Tua can do based on his ability to play quarterback? I am willing to find out once again that we're talking about two low end QV two. So it's not, you know, the biggest deal uh, in the world here, but these are the types of questions, you know, when you rank 400 players uh, that you end up spending a bunch of time on. Finally, you know, similar to Baker, just darts now. So you're at the end of your drafts, you know, you've got your starting quarterbacks, but hey, we're playing dynasty, you know, usually we're these uh, drafts are going far longer than your traditional, you know, 16, 17 round redraft. So we got to pick some guys. Don't sleep on Jameis Winston or Mitchell Trubisky. These are both guys that, you know, 
based on the popular opinion that the 2022 draft of, draft class of rookie quarterbacks isn't going to be all that great, James and Trubisky probably the two hottest free agents in terms of being able to go to a team and get that starting job. Before you laugh about Trubisky, I mean, I'm, I don't want to misquote the guy. I'm fairly confident as Daniel uh, Jeremiah, who actually said back in like um, – November that Trubisky would be like a candidate to start in a lot of places. You know, he just got to spend a year behind Josh Allen, Brian Dable. You know, everyone looks at this type of quarterback with the arm strength, you know, former number two overall pick, and they think they can fix him. So I can't find that quote. I swear, people, there's there could be some Trubisky. Like Baker, yeah, there's been a lot of bad with Trubisky, but at least he has shown the ability to be good um, at, at one point in time. And that was in the year, uh, first Nagy year, 2018, I believe. A lot of QB one weeks, actually, before that uh, original shoulder injury. Here we go. From Daniel, oh my gosh, I can't find it. I apologize if I misquoted Daniel Jeremiah. One of these reporters who I respect said uh, towards the end of uh, the season that Trubisky will be a candidate to start somewhere in 2022. Probably talked about him uh, too much already. Just realized, like, more than anything, these are quarterbacks that you aren't going to see in many people's top 30s, but the second free agency finishes up and we find out they are going to be starting somewhere, we're going to see a big-time ranking bump. So you can do you, you can do worse than spending a late-round pick on a likely starting quarterback in the year 2022, maybe even beyond. So that wraps up the quarterback discussion. Before we continue going, I just want to give a quick shout out to some of our lovely sponsors. And that is going to start off with one of my favorite companies out there, DraftKings, because guess what, Hoops fans, the latest offer from DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA, is too good to pass up. I'm talking between the legs, 360, windmill good. New customers can bet just $1 on any team and get $150 in free bets if they win. It's that simple. Download DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code PFF. Bet just $1 on any NBA team. Get $150 in free bets if they win. That's promo code PFF at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Must be 21 or older. Minimum age and location requirements vary by jurisdiction. See DraftKings.com for a full list of requirements and state-specific gambling re gaming resources. If you have a gambling problem, call 1-800-GAMBLER. Also got to send some love to Western Southern because the Fantasy Podcast is sponsored by Western Southern Financial Group. While you focus on your roster moves, Western Southern helps advance your money moves. Buying your first home, plan to start a family, wondering how to make your money grow. Western Southern's playbook of life insurance, investment, and retirement solutions helps you rest assured on game day. So team up to understand Understand these and address goals with a game plan built just for you. Get started at westernsouthern.com slash PFF. Finally, folks, you can get 25% off any PFF sub if you use code FANCY. These Dynasty ranks I'm going over, they're free. Check them out. But hey, this is, you know, February 15th. I had to adjust for Odo Beckham tearing his ACL, you know, two days ago. They will continue to be adjusted throughout the season. Nathan Yonkies as well. Dre McFarlane, we will have these rankings live on the site for you. You just got to go get a PFF subscription. So again, you can get all those rankings, locked article content, our NFL draft guide, which is some fantastic content from Mike Leonard and the rest of our college football game. Draft and great, I mean, data and grades from the entire 2021 season, 2022 free agent rankings that, that and so much more. So again, 25% off any PFF subscription. Just got to use code FANTASY. Let's talk a little running backs here. Again, going to have a nice conversation uh, later this week, specifically on the topic, but top 12 running backs. And again, we're focusing on age more than ever here. I have number one, Jonathan Taylor. Number two, Najee Harris. Number three, Christian McCaffrey. Followed by Javante Williams, DeAndre Swift, Antonio Gibson, Joe Mixon, Saquon Barkley, Austin Eckler, Alvin Kamara. Rounding out the top 12, Nick Chubb and Dalvin Cook. Yeah. People are going to hate me for not putting Derrick Henry higher. I'm sorry, people. Again, he has been an exception. He has been an outlier. How much longer is he going to be that? Because right now, I'm not fading him based on the injury from last year. I'm not fading him based on the workload he had. I, I, I don't think the injury he had last year came from the large workload. You can say that. You can say he had 400 touches in 2020. That's why he got hurt in 2021. Well, why didn't he get hurt in 2020 after he had 400 plus touches in 2019? So I did do an article over the past few weeks looking at what happens a season after an especially large workload. And guys, like the answer is really nothing. There's no good way of actually co coming through and figuring out what the problem is. I mean, again, I went back all the way to 2006, looked at all these guys with 400 plus touches. And just in general, I mean, only five 
of the 19 applicable running backs failed to play at least 14 games the next year. So, you know, we can talk about just in general, the efficiency going down. But if you look at a running back in their entire career, it tends to go down year after year because once again, we see younger running backs are better than older running backs. So it's not the season before touch load I'm worried about. It's more so the 1500 professional carry club. Uh, if you guys caught the 10 questions episode with my guy Tej, he's done some fantastic work on regression with running backs. And the prime number is 1500 professional carries. That's when we see a marketable and, you know, just honest, historically accurate drop off in their efficiency and ability to create yardage above expectation. And right now in the 1500 professional carry club, we have Ezekiel Elliott, Derrick Henry and Melvin Gordon. So Henry, he's on your team, you know, redraft. I'm going to have him higher than uh, RB 13 for sure. But it's just one of those things where maybe he keeps on, you know, outproducing expectation. I know he's got the workload to boot. But at the end of the day, Henry has had such a large workload already. He's about to be 28. He's checking every red flag box we, we could ask for, man. He's not a pass catcher. It's, it's just too many uh, question marks for me to warrant taking Henry over some of these other guys. As we'll get to a wide receiver, another kind of big point here is, draft more wide receivers than running backs early in dynasty because we have a longer career and we're much more confident in predicting them year over year at least in more than near term future as opposed to long term so that's basically top 12 top 13 including uh derrick henry and yeah age is the primary factor here i mean jonathan taylor 23 Najee harris about to turn 24 mccaffrey's only 25 and a half and already gone over this, but McCaffrey is my number one redraft running back for next year because he's averaged the most PPR points per game in NFL history. So if you really think that Christian McCaffrey, that pulled hamstring and that sprained ankle he suffered last year, if you're saying, wow, those are two injuries that nobody can come back from, you know, fair play to you. But what I've learned is that we do not, we cannot predict injuries nearly as well as we think we can. And McCaffrey has not had the sort of injuries that do warrant the sort of, you know, drop off long term. So Taylor, Great year. We'll see what this offense looks like next year. If they manage to somehow bring in like a Russell Wilson type, okay. But right now, Jonathan Taylor is still in an offense that is paying Naeem Hines a lot of money to be their pass down back. And again, one of the other issues I had with Taylor going to last year, and hey, I was wrong. But the idea behind me being wrong, the process, if you will, uh, was that the drop off from Phillip Rivers to Carson Wentz, you know, was going to result in a worse scoring offense. And to Wentz's credit, Okay, he wasn't great by any stretch. We didn't get back to 2017 MVP version. But this Indianapolis Colts team, huge, po very solid point differential. We all saw what happened in week 18. Could have, should have, would have been a playoff team. And I'm just not so convinced that they're going to be that good again in 2022 to foster the sort of positive game scripts that allow Jonathan Taylor to eat. And hey, I don't know if he's going to be able to average 5.6 yards per carry every season as well. So the last uh, running back to repeat as the overall RB1 was um, – Priest Holmes back in 2003, 2004. I got McCaffrey over Taylor in redraft, but Dynasty, yeah, give me the guy that's two and a half years younger and that we know we at least have another two, three years of him just racking up ridiculous uh, rush attempt totals. Behind McCaffrey, again, you know, Javante and Jandre Swift, neither is above 23. Javante hasn't even turned 22 yet. Sure would help matters if Melvin Gordon gets out of the picture. But once again, based on his carries, I also wouldn't just be shocked that Javante takes that situation over sooner rather than later. Each of Gibson, Mixon, Saquon, 25 and a half years of age or younger. After that's kind of the drop off. Austin Eckler is going to be 27 by week one next year. Same thing with Alvin Kamara. Nick Chubb just turned 26. Alvin Cook's starting to get up there. He'll be 27 and Cook with that legal issues and even the recurring shoulder problems he's someone i'm fine you know dropping them down a little bit further in the ranks than other guys might so the one thing i would bring up with cook i love alexander madison i mean this dude has played three years in the nfl he's still not even 24 yet you know you could argue last year based on you know all you Tony Pollard over Ezekiel Elliott people, I think there's an argument that Madison was better than Dalvin Cook based on what we saw last year. I've been hesitant to explicitly say, you know, Tony Pollard is 100% better than Zeke. I'm not trying to say that about Madison and Cook either, but just based on the metrics we like to use, yards per carry, yards after contact, missed tackles force, Madison was the one ascending last year. Cook was the one other than, you know, the Thursday night game where we didn't even know if he was going to play. He proceeds to go for 200 plus against Pittsburgh. Other than that game, and include that game just as a season we really didn't see dalvin look as good as he has in past years i'm not so sure we're going to see him all of a sudden get better in the future in a new regime potentially without Kirk cousins uh, as well sooner rather than later 
Final point before I get to some other uh, kind of late round darlings, Cam Akers is, you know, the really big question mark here. Some people are so far back in on him that he's now a top five, top six dynasty running back in some circles. I have him as RB14, one spot behind Derrick Henry, just a couple spots ahead of J.K. Dobbins, Michael Carter. I'm not dinging Akers. I'm not looking all that good in the playoffs. I mean... I thought, they, I thought he passed the eye test better than he did the uh, spreadsheet test, if you will. I, I've seen it. Worst, I, I tweet this. Worst PFF rushing grade, you know, lowest yards per carry in the league among qualified backs. It has been horrendous. You also kind of look at, uh, you know, the Rams kind of schedule to end the year. I don't my friends at Pro Football Reference as I'm pulling this up. But, yeah, you know, week 18 and on. or I'm sorry, let's go week 17 and beyond. Ravens, 49ers, Cardinals, Buccaneers, 49ers, Bengals. The Bengals are the only one of that group that had anything that, you know, was not an absolutely elite run defense. I know they shut down Akers as well. But, you know, it wasn't like Akers was going out there and getting shut down while Sony Michelle and Daryl Henderson are just absolutely falling out. So my bigger question is, what's his workload going to be? Is it going to be what we saw? on the you know wow uh, the divisional round against Tampa Bay where he was getting a legit three down workload or is it going to be what we saw in the NFC Championship and the Super Bowl which is much more of a split back committee than we're used to I do think he will be the starter but I'm not as convinced that especially you know coming off the Achilles not that that seemed to hinder what he was doing on field again I test in my opinion was far better than uh you know what his statistical metrics are telling us but McVay's a smart guy. If McVay's even there, that's another problem. And he saw Gurley fall off a cliff. He saw what happened to Akers when he started to push. And I guess that was, I, I shouldn't compare them just yet. My point is, McVay has seen an Achilles injury to his bell car running back and the other bell car running back completely fall off a cliff with knee arthritis. So I don't think uh, it's a situation where he's necessarily going to be signing up to give Akers a sort of top five, top six workload um, that we've seen from Rams running backs in the past. Maybe that's why in the most important games of the year, he didn't get that same workload. But that Akers story, man, that's going to help make or break things because if he's going RB4, 14 and redraft that's going to be awfully tough to pass up based on the potential upside that we've seen from these rams running backs there's just a big question mark with what he's getting everyone else in this group man some other guys have some question marks in terms of their uh, usage with new staffs. You know, David Montgomery, what's Josh Jacobs going to be like, Travis Etienne, um, and everything. But Cam Akers is that one with the upside is the freaking moon in terms of touch potential. Uh, it just remains to be seen exactly which version we are going to get. Again, you can find all these rankings on pff.com. Uh, but some other late round guys I do like, in addition to my guy, Alexander Madison, who comes in as my RB31. Uh, Chris Evans for the Bengals. Right now, Samaj P. Ryan is someone that could be off the team uh, ahead of next year if they feel like saving a little bit of money. And honestly, Joe Mixon, too. I'm not sure why they would get rid of Joe Mixon, but you know what? I'm also not exactly sure why you have Joe Mixon paying him this sort of money. And then you don't decide to use him on third and fourth and one in the freaking Super Bowl. I actually know why. It's because they've used P. Ryan as a third down back. But what are you paying Mixon all this money for? They can feasibly get out of it, you know, uh, after this year. I don't think they will. But if they want, yeah, okay. If they want to trade, let's see, does it work for cutting too? If they want to trade or cut Joe Mixon after June 1st, they'll save almost $9 million against the cap, only inherit about $2.75 million in dead money. And this is the same thing for the next three years. So this is what we see a lot of times with these bigger contracts. The five-year, you know, this was a four-year, $48 million extension that was essentially, uh, you know, a nice little one-year bump in 2021 and then gives the Bengals uh, three years to potentially get out of it if they like. Similar to Ezekiel Elliott's contract where they have another year in 2022 where, yes, they, they cannot get out of that. He is going to be a Dallas Cowboy wearing a star on his helmet. 2023 and beyond, you can more or less write those years off if you want to because they have the cap savings ability to get out of the deal. So I'm just saying, Chris Evans is basically free. He flashed some really high receiving ability, even as a wide receiver. I think he does have a theoretical three-down skill set, and he could be attached to Joe Burrow for a long time with the potential for a starting job emerging sooner rather than later. I know the Bengals have all kinds of cap room. I'm not saying mix him will be cut but hey when we can take a chance on someone like chris evans who has the single toughest skill to find that we're looking for in the first place in fantasy and that is the high-end receiving ability we already know he has that he's cheap as hell we're a p ryan or a mix in roster move away from his adp and rankings absolutely exploding i would like to be ahead of that 
another running back, last name Evans, Darrington Evans for the Titans. Guys, it's just been a rough career for him. Only played one game last year. Let's not forget, though, this is a third round pick that is theoretically Derrick Henry's backup. So someone like myself that is kind of fading the idea of Henry being this world beater for another half decade. If he gets hurt and Darrington Evans is healthy, Evans is stepping in as the lead guy. And we also saw, you know, Dontrell Hilliard and even Jerry McNichols there for a little bit, just racking up the receptions, uh, you know, going back here a little bit. Maybe I'm just holding on too long, but report from Peter King before 2020, ridiculous August hoopla, perhaps, but they were, the Titans were kind of trying to say Evans was going to be like their poor man's Alvin Kamara. So we just haven't seen him healthy enough to do any of this. I'm not saying he's going to have any standalone value as long as Henry's healthy. I, he would be the heavy candidate, though, to be the you know, locked-in RB1, the guy that's on top of every single waiver wire article, though, as soon as Henry, if and when he suffers another injury. And finally, similar sentiment, just they're free, and there's a chance that they just boom up there if an injury happens, is Anthony McFarlane over there with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Each of Benny Snell, Kalen Balaj are free agents. I don't think either has really done enough to warrant Pittsburgh bringing them back. Maybe they do, but in McFarlane's case, you know, someone that also had to go through a lot of injuries this last year, on paper, for the time being, he would be the handcuff to Najee Harris. So when we have guys like Najee and Derrick Henry, who would each would each push for the league high in total touches with a full season in health, I'm interested in their backup running back when we can get these guys like literally outside the top 50 um, at the position. So Chris Evans, Darrington Evans, Anthony McFarlane, fine late round darts, you know, scoop them off the freaking waiver wire if they're there. Because again, I think they are potentially just one injury, one roster move away from really shooting up the ranks. And that is going to conclude our running back talk. Moving right along the wide receiver. And, you know, I kind of mentioned this during the start of the running back discussion, but prioritize wide receivers. If it's close, take the wide receiver. We have a longer career span. We just are better at predicting them year over year. And my God, all the studs, like running back guys, once we kind of get to like the RB30 range, like we're talking about guys like, you know, Pollard, Madison, James Robinson, James Conner, Melvin Gordon, Rashad Penny, Chase Edmonds, like there's pathways to them finding the right team, getting the right situation. We saw what James Conner did last year, but for every James Conner, uh, you know, there's going to be some busts along the way as well. So I'm not necessarily anticipating those guys keeping on, keeping on, but you look at the wide receiver 30 range, we got Brandon Ayuk, Mike Williams, Amon Ross St. Brown, Jerry G. Judy, Gabriel Davis, Darnell Mooney, not saying those guys have, you know, a way clearer pathway to success, but you could imagine, you know, type, uh, type of situation. So with the wide receivers first, let's go through my top 12. Number one, I'm going with Jamar Chase over Justin Jefferson, who has been better to start their career. I think it's Jefferson by a hair. I'll take the guy that's paired up with uh, Joe Burrow for the foreseeable future, uh, no matter what Carson Palmer has to say about that. Easy wide receiver three, the AJB himself, number four, DK Metcalf, and number five, CD Lamb. The guy's not even 23 yet. Look at the Cowboys wide receiver room. The only guy guaranteed to be back there next year is CD Lamb. Sounds like Amari Cooper is trending towards being kept, but man, they can save about 20 million against that cap if they change their mind. Gallup coming off the ACL. Cedric Wilson's a free agent. But like freaking Turner is a free agent. And I mean, look, CD, okay, he didn't just explode last year and have the top five season, but he's sure shown enough, I believe, uh, through these first two years to think that, hey, this guy is going to be Dak Prescott's number one pass game option for the foreseeable future. I want to invest in that. That's where I'm drawing the line. All these guys, A.J. Brown's the oldest. He'll be 25 by week one next year. But all these guys, you know, are under 25 years of age at the moment. I'm just going to prioritize that. I'm going to take the five-year advantage over guys like Cooper Cup, who's going to be 29. Devontae Adams will be 29. Tyreek Hill, 28. I'm just going to take those extra years. I think that based on what we've seen historically, we can expect, you know, maybe one of, if not more, of Cup, Adams, Hill to at least take somewhat of a step back within the next three years. Meanwhile, these other guys, Chase, Jefferson, Brown, Metcalf, and Lamb, should be feasibly hitting their even higher prime uh, by the time that comes around. So, look. Draft all these guys. This is not my way of trying to say fade Cup, fade Adams or anything. They still have more than a few good years left. I'll take the guys that potentially have five to eight really good years left over the ones with only three to five. After them, T. Higgins, wide receiver nine, Debo Samuel, wide receiver 10, Stefan Diggs, wide receiver 11, and DJ Moore, wide receiver 12. So this DJ Moore, kind of the high end, you know, borderline wide receiver one spot. These guys could really make or break everything. And I got them all in the same tier where it's wide receiver 12, 
DJ Moore, then Deontay Johnson, Jalen Waddle, Terry McLaurin, Calvin Ridley, Chris Godwin. We've seen each of these guys flash true wide receiver one ability at different points in time. The question is, what's their offense going to be like with a likely quarterback change? I mean, obviously, DJ Moore has already gone through several. Deontay Johnson will be going through his first major one, with all due respect, you know, Mason Rudolph's like one or two games. He started over the past two years. Waddle's with Tua for now. That's also a thing, like what's the offense going to look like in a new system and with healthier wide receivers around him. Terry McLaurin, God, him and DJ Moore, you know, are just battling to be this generation's Allen Robinson, Andre Johnson, just laundry list of terrible quarterbacks you're forced to play with. Calvin Ridley, I'm not sure what his future's like in Atlanta uh, at the moment. I hope his, you know, personal stuff gets figured out. And then Chris Goblin, you know, maybe leaving the Buccaneers either way, definitely leaving Tom Brady. And similar to Mike Evans, guys, like, Goblin is great. I'm not trying to take that away from him. And you do earn targets, but we have seen Goblin as a fantasy darling with Jameis Winston just force feeding him targets and playing with the freaking goat, Tom Brady. So like Chris Goblin, hey, if we see him go to Green Bay or something like that, okay, he's going to be shooting up these ranks. But as things stand right now, I do think there might be a little bit lower floor here than we're anticipating. Coming off that injury, uh, no joke. I know I'm saying, no, we're not trying to predict future injuries, but current injuries that are actually ha actively happening right now, that we're not predicting are going to happen in the future. Those are definitely something we should be con concerning ourselves with kind of bouncing around. I have Elijah Moore wide receiver, 18 Devonte Smith, 19 Michael Pittman, 20. I'm just taking those guys ahead of another crop of very good, but older wide receivers we're trying to be a year early, not a year late on these guys. So Keenan Allen, Amari Cooper, Mike Evans, Tyra Lockett, Deandre Hopkins, all these guys could be at least 28 years old. Even Cooper, as hard as that is to believe by a uh, week one next season. You know, if you want to move up Evans past Keenan, I'm not going to disagree with you. This is definitely a tier of guys, but again, based on that kind of 30 year old, drop off we've seen at the position in past years um, i'm just going to prioritize those younger receivers i think still have a lot more gas in the tank uh just some other notes here i love the idea of buying low on chase claypool everyone M maybe you don't like him because he celebrated a first down uh that's that's what it comes down to i think that might actually be impacting his adp at this point but look the guy scored 11 touchdowns as a rookie he's still 23 years old he would have had over a thousand total yards last year with good health all with Big Ben's corpse under center. So, hey, guys, I love Deontay Johnson. I think his tape is better than the efficiency metrics uh, denote. With that said, I don't love pulling up yards per target, you know, leaderboards and these different uh, yards per – I'm not sure how we mentioned yards per route run – you pull up way too many leaderboards for wide receivers, and I don't like seeing Deontay Johnson in the bottom 10 as often as he is. It didn't matter when Big Ben was force-feeding him targets anyway. Who's to say that's still going to be the case with a different quarterback? Under center, Claypool, you know, I have Deontay Johnson ranked ahead of him. I'm not trying to make this argument, but where the rest of the industry has Claypool, um, I do think he is worthy of being my favorite by low candidate in all of Dynasty at the moment. On some other late-round targets I do like, Josh Palmer for the Chargers. Very possibly, he's my wide receiver 43 at the moment, but Palmer could very possibly be Justin Herbert's wide receiver too, as early as 2022, maybe beyond. They have a ton of cap room, but I think it'd be, I think it'd behoove them to spend most of that cap room on the defensive side of the ball. I'm not saying they shouldn't replace Mike Williams. I'm sure they will to an extent. Dylan Guyton's also someone uh, that they're at the risk of losing. All their tight ends, uh, except for Donald Parham, who's an exclusive right exclusive rights free agent they they are facing the prospect of losing either way josh palmer i thought flashed last year still just 22 years old not a minimum should be in three wide receiver sets last year so i think right now he's kind of being priced at his floor like okay i think justin herbert's number three wide receiver can be a boomer bust wide receiver four uh for the foreseeable future god forbid he actually gets to step up and gets a chance to be that offense's number two pass game option now we're talking about a legitimate wide receiver two uh potentially curtis samuel Who's the next Debo Samuel? Maybe Curtis Samuel. I mean, hell, the guy's still only 25 years old. Why did last year suck? Injuries. Before that, he was a wide receiver too with Teddy freaking Bridgewater under center being used as a dual threat wide receiver running back. So really the only guys we've seen in recent years that command a bunch of carries as a wide receiver, at least in terms of the position, positional designation, it's been Debo. Cordero Patterson, they finally kind of switched to running back because that's what he's freaking been playing. Curtis Samuel and Robert Woods. And even Woods was starting to kind of go away a little bit this year as the Rams have kind of evolved their rushing attack. So Samuel is legit someone where, hey, J.D. McKissick is a free agent. Um, you know, depending on what kind of happens there, Curtis Samuel could be getting us that fancy-friendly 
five to seven targets per game with two to three rush attempts on top of it. And to get him as cheap as he is right now, you know, really most mostly across the industry being priced as a wide receiver five or lower. Uh, just realize this man is awfully young. He's shown off a lot of upside, um, I think, to be this cheap. Donovan Peoples-Jones for the Browns. You know, why would I let my OBJ feelings get off of a cheap number one outside receiver that they're basically using to replace OBJ? I mean, people's Jones flashed that he's flashed really throughout his entire two year career. Maybe the Browns, you know, are going to go try to spend up. But man, they drafted Anthony Schwartz in the third round last year. And while he was out there, it was pretty clear Donovan people's Jones was their number one outside wide receiver. And he, you know, really overstepped Rashard Higgins as well, who I think has shown more chemistry with Baker Mayfield than any of those existing wide receivers save for Jarvis Landry who's just not really in the picture because he's you know from living in the friendly confines of the slot so Donovan Peoples-Jones is someone where we kind of already seen he can be a boomer bust wide receiver four with a hurt version of Baker God forbid Baker takes a nice step forward, which we've seen him do at multiple points in his career. Again, all of a sudden we're looking at Baker's number two pass game option being priced right now, freaking as like a wide receiver five, wide receiver six. And hey, again, not saying he's going to immediately be a wide receiver two, but I think we'll see that ranking difference just boom if we could have more certainty with Baker being under center. By these guys, you know, closer to their floor than their ceiling whenever possible. I think that uh, describes people's Jones. And guys, Brian Edwards, T.O. ran. Andy Moss himself, still just 23 years old. I think there's enough concern, you know, about his ability to separate, you know, Derek Carr not exactly force feeding him the ball to be worried. But with Brian Edwards, we just haven't seen a ton of games from him where it's like too big of a reason. Like, okay, he's not getting eight, nine targets and just catching one of them. And I, I know you need to earn your targets, but Henry Ruggs wasn't earning targets his first year until he was in the second year as well. This this Raiders offense is kind of funky. Credit to Hunter Renfro for taking over. I know Edwards has, you know, some things that he needs to be doing to be better at the game of football. But again, guys, Brian Edwards is a third round pick, 81st overall in the 2020 draft. He's still just 23 years old. He's flashed a little bit. And again, he's free in fantasy land. So all those good things that people have said about him still hold true. Yeah, you know, like he didn't have a single game last year with more than six targets. So, you know, excuse me for not exactly completely throwing the guy away when he still looks like a starting wide receiver for Derek Carr. Maybe someone else sooner rather than later. I don't know. I'm, I'm not here to hate on Derek. Car. I think he's, you know, more than done enough with the pieces he's had over the years, but it's a starting wide receiver that at least has shown some semblance of upside on limited targets in a situation where maybe he gets, you know, more target share in the future uh, if they decide not to make any roster moves. So, you know, please social media team. I don't want to be out there saying like Brian Nevers is my guy. Go get him. He's free though in dynasty land right now with the upside for much more. So that again is the definition of buying guys at their floor as opposed to their ceiling. Uh, if Brian Nevers is, you know, the worst guy sitting at the end of your wide receiver death chart in dynasty, um, I'm telling you, it's not the worst thing in the world. Let's close things out with tight ends. Everybody appreciate you tuning in to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. As always, tight end one, Mark Andrews, still just 25 years of age. And the fact that he showed he could ball out with not just Lamar Jackson, but Tyler Huntley and Josh Johnson as well. I think earns him that spot. Just knocked off Travis Kelsey, who had previously been the tight end one five years running. Number two, Kyle Pitts. I love the bitch about him being used as a wide receiver, but great. He had over a thousand yards. He is being called a tight end. We'll treat him as a tight end. Easy dynasty tight end two. George Kittle, tight end three. If we didn't have to worry about Debo or Ayuk like legitimately being used over him in a run first 49ers offense, I'd be down to put Kittle higher. For my money, he is the best real life tight end in the world, but we're not playing real life football, we're playing fantasy football. For that reason, he's my tight end three. Travis Kelsey, tight end four. Again, with tight ends, we've seen these guys play and continue to produce for a longer time than running backs and wide receivers. So I don't think Kelsey is about to fall off a cliff. Nothing from his film last year, I think, would tell us that. With that said, he's 32. When we have Andrews, Pitts, and Kittle there, I'm just going to take, you know, the youth with similar, albeit not quite uh, Kelsey-like upside. Behind Kelsey, I got Darren Waller, TJ Hawkinson, guys that, hey, right now, they're, they're, their team is number one pass game option. It just doesn't feel too set in stone for me. That's why they're, you know, fifth and sixth. I still think that both Waller and Hawkinson have shown enough efficiency-wise uh, to continue to be tight end ones, even if their team goes ahead and, you know, gets more of an alpha wide receiver one to take away more a lot of the target share. 
Dallas Goddard, tight end seven. Dawson Knox, tight end eight. Uh, both these guys, Goddard especially, man, just being set up. Really could be his offense's uh, number one pass game option during any given week. I would imagine Devontae Smith gets that role more, more times than not. Uh, and then Dawson Knox, you know, he's a little bit different where he's not going to ever be the number one, number two guy. When we got Josh Allen under center. Who the hell cares? And rounding out the tight end one ranks. Noah Fant, tight end nine. Pat Fryer tight end 10. Cole Komet, tight end 11. And Dalton Schultz, tight end 12. Schultz will boom up there, man, if the Cowboys give him a legit extension. I'm not sure, though. Blake Jarwin quietly has the 13th most valuable contract among all tight ends. Like, they paid him to be Dak's number one tight end. He got hurt in tw- all of 2020, and then 2021, they were splitting work. Sh- Schultz, to his credit, I think just played better, and then Jarwin got hurt again. So maybe the Cowboys find a way to move on from Jarwin. Maybe they just don't care, and they're fine paying two tight ends. Uh, just realize Schultz, you know, really just – I think more of a product of his system. So Schultz is someone that's really going to rise or fall depending on what happens. The uh, history of free agent tight ends changing teams is absolutely uh, uh, brutal, people. I cannot overstate just how bad it's been. Um, Let's see. The largest free agent tight end contracts with a new team since 2016 – Johnny Smith and Hunter Henry on the Patriots, Austin Hooper on the Browns, Kobe Fleener on the Saints, Trey Burton, Bears, Jimmy Graham, Packers, and Bears, Jesse James with the Lions, Martellus Bennett with the Packers, Ladarius Green, what a throwback name with the Steelers, Tyler Croft with the Bills, Rhett Ellison, and Deion Sims uh, with the Giants and Bears, respectively. So, yeah, not freaking good uh, when you have a productive tight end and the team that allowed him to be productive decides to move on. uh, Really take a long, hard look at that next team because we just have not seen them from a fantasy perspective put up the sorts of numbers that we're used to seeing so keep that in mind about schultz and also people don't forget about the vikings tight end of the future irv smith obviously missed this whole year but still just 23 and a half years old tyler conklin is a free agent kyle rudolph obviously now a member of the new york football giants we got new coaching staff coming in maybe that means they actually lean on their number one tight end irv smith instead of deploying the sort of two tight end system that they did with irvin rudolph and that they were expected to do with irvin conklin so maybe conklin comes back maybe he doesn't obviously if he doesn't that would clear things up even more but i think irv should be their locked in starter either way and maybe with the new system we don't see them have that sort of split uh, that they've had in past years um some late round darts i love and I'm already falling into it again, everyone. Every every offseason, we look at the tight end position, and we just start imagining the ways for these late-round targets to work out. But, hey, let's do it. Let's have fun. It's February. Uh, David Njoku, current free agent. Just, just go go to Seattle or go to play with Deshaun Watson or really where I would love to go to the Chargers and be Justin Herbert's featured guy. I like Donald Parham, everyone, but you heard from Daniel Popper, ace Chargers beat writer himself, when he came on this podcast. I don't think Parham, and the Chargers apparently don't either, has what it takes to be an every down tight end option. I do think David Njoku, former first round pick, has that ability. Um, so yeah, maybe Parham stays there and they bring in the Juke Njoku and they run the similar Jared Cook, Steven Anderson, Parham, three way rotation. Njoku, though, I maintain if he can go and be the tight end one somewhere and get those 80, 90 targets afforded to an offensive starter, uh, could do some big things with it. Fellow former Miami Hurricane, Brevin Jordan, right now is starting tight end for the Houston Texans and just 21 and a half years old. All the other tight ends on the Texans, Jordan Akins and Farrell Browns of the world are free agents. Not saying they're all going to leave. You know, it's, we're making some assumptions here with the free agency class. But either way, Brevin is looking like the tight end one ahead of 2022. God forbid the guy that has just was able to start drinking not that long ago, starts to improve a little bit more. Uh, I do think it's rare you see someone that did flash a little bit as a rookie at a position that notoriously never does anything in their first year in the league. He's awfully affordable um, as someone that, again, profile as well as an athlete and just is really looking at a clean depth chart as early as next year. Um, Also like Dan Arnold, Maybe he is Trevor Lawrence's tight end uh, one of the future. We need to make some leaps because, again, I realize it was a different regime that brought him to Jacksonville. But it's another depth chart that, you know, once you dig into it, really isn't as strong as you think. And Dan Arnold is another one of these guys where uh, in the Mike Jasicki, Kyle Pitts kind of uh, range where, yeah, maybe they line up as, in, as an inline tight end sometimes. But this guy is truly more of a wide receiver. So these types of, you know, true pass first pass catchers I want to prioritize and to Arnold's credit when Jacksonville asked him to play in every down roll he was able to do so and then maintain that job until he got hurt finally my guy Dwayne one Dwayne McFarlane's favorite as well Tommy Tremble 
Thomas Trembles because Ian Thomas, love the first name, but he is a free agent ahead of next year. Tommy Tremble, borderline erotic athletic profile. I didn't love him coming out more so because he was never really used as a receiver. The Panthers were able to get him the ball in space, though. He looked good within his hands, still doesn't turn 22 years old. And you know what? If I don't think he's a receiver, who the hell cares what I think? If the Panthers think he can be their three down tight end, then hell, let's treat him as that the same way and go get a freaking starting tight end in an offense that, okay, hasn't used him a lot, but they are changing play callers. Maybe Matt Rule has a change of heart. Maybe Tommy Tremble is good enough to actually just carve out a little bit of a role for himself. So the only reason we couldn't touch Carolina last year and as someone that, you know, if you guys read it, I wrote wide receiver, cornerback, and tight end breakdown every single week. I've done it for like the last five years. I mean, it, it was just one of those teams where in fantasy football, when you have two tight ends, you really don't have one. So the Panthers, it was never a situation where we were fading Tommy Trumbull or Ian Thomas because if anything was wrong with them necessarily, it was just because they were both splitting snaps and targets alike week in and week out, and we couldn't deal with it. Same thing with the Browns, you know, the Patriots to an extent. I know Henry kind of pulled away. But he was more so just getting, I think, not lucky with touchdowns, but let's face it, uh, awfully touchdown dependent uh, last year. Just a bunch of teams uh, in this similar situation. Tennessee Titans. Oh, God, Anthony Burks are bringing up some bad memories now. But if we can take Tremble from a 50% uh, tight end snap wise to 90%, yeah, I'm a little bit interested in seeing how that might go. So that is going to wrap up this edition of the PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. Hope you guys all enjoyed the breakdown. Um, I know solo edition, sometimes I'm, I'm not doing the best, uh, you know, uh, making annoying noises, wherever the hell the issue might be. But I uh, just wanted to, you know, get this off my chest. And again, I want to point out that I'm going to be having some of the best minds in the industry on over the next uh, two, three weeks, talking all things Dynasty. My guys, Dwayne McFarlane and Nathan Yonke will also be back. They're enjoying a little vacation right now. Great day to be great. And you guys should be going on vacation too. It's February. I cannot wait until it's March. I'm going to be in Vegas for two of the four first weekends. And there, go get in some sunshine. So thanks again for tuning in. Early part of the off season. I'm excited for what we got ahead of us. Uh, let's go win some freaking money in Dynasty, people. So uh, feel free, you know, especially on Twitter in the off season. You know, I apologize for not always being able to get uh, to all the DMs and mentions in season. But off season, you know, I really want to do everything I can uh, to answer any questions you guys might have. And um, hopefully in future episodes, we can start doing, you know, more of a Q&A element for anyone that's interested in that type of thing. So let me know. Appreciate you guys tuning in as always. Until next time, take care, everybody. <laughs>